Okay. Um, all right, so before I start talking about the alpha, um, are there any questions about the syllabus or assignments or anything that I talked about last week? Um, Okay, um, so uh, this book, The Alpha, um, my, my personal experience with it was um, that I was, um, when I was starting out in grad school, the um, I don't know, like the general feeling was that Carnap in the Alphau had undertaken a simple, a kind of simple minded project, which uh, failed, and which Quine especially had um, made clear not only not only made obvious that it had failed but made obvious why it was hopeless all along um and furthermore as quine was supposed to have made clear uh the rest of the history of logical positivism was basically just a confused attempt to react to the failure of the alpha um so in other words, and I mean, we'll see Quine saying this, so you don't have to take my word for it, but, um, but, but people had uh, um, pretty much felt that Quine was right. So there had been this one book published in 1928, and then this philosophical movement that continued well into the 50s and 60s. Uh, it was no longer so dominant after some time in the 50s, I guess, but certainly continued. Um, that that whole movement was kind of like people not realizing why the Alpha project was hopeless and trying to fix it up. Although I guess I should say at the same time, the feeling was that uh, despite being such a failure, somehow Carnap had managed to show that most of traditional philosophy was either um, irrelevant or at least that he had shown in what terms you had to try to understand it. Um, so that's, I mean, that's kind of strange. I mean, that's a typical type of contradiction in the history of philosophy. But in any case, um, so the view was more or less that this book was interesting, if at all, only as a interesting example of a stupid mistake. <laughs> um, uh, and at the time, this was a long time ago now, uh, my first year of, grad, of philosophy grad school was 1993, I guess. So um, at the time, the Aufbau was out of print in German and in English. Um, however, uh, it so happened that um, one of my professors assigned some of it. Um, I guess, you know, he wasn't so sure that it wasn't interesting, but anyway, he wanted to start with that. Uh, it was like an intro philosophy of science course, kind of like this, only if you can imagine it, much more disorganized than I am. <laughs> and uh, like he would basically, like, he would come in every day and be like, Oh, look, I just thought maybe we should read this. So here's like I photocopied it. <laughs> but anyway, so one of the things that he thought, hey, let's read some of the Aufbau. So um, I read some of it and I read the preface to the first edition, which was not assigned. And I was like, 
wow, actually, this guy doesn't sound stupid at all, number one. Um, number two, I was like, wow, this guy sounds kind of like Heidegger. What a strange coincidence. Later, I realized it wasn't a strange coincidence at all. They even knew each other. Um, <laughs> but never mind that. Uh, so I'm not talking about Heidegger in this course. Um, so I, you know, eventually sat down and read the whole thing and thought, wow, this actually is uh, not, I mean, oh, I'm convinced that he's right and Quine is wrong. Like, you don't find that in the history of philosophy, or like, you shouldn't. Sometimes people do. Like, there's people running around who think that Hegel was right about everything, or Kant was right about everything, or, you know, but... Um, None of these philosophers were right about everything. In fact, most of them were very wrong about some very important things. But uh, that's not really why I read them. We're not looking for someone who's right. We're looking for someone who's interesting, who prompts philosophical reflection, something like that. I don't know how to put my finger on it. So um, and yeah, I concluded that Carnap was definitely that. So um, I think I was not the only one who had an experience like that since what, then in the past, whatever, 27 years. Um, there has been kind of a renaissance of interest in Carnap and the history of logical positivism in general. Um, uh, although it's not like all the people involved agree about what Carnap means. Um, so anyway, I'm going to pretty much teach you what I think Carnap means, um, but we'll get to, to, the, to Quine's epistemology naturalized, so you'll see where the other view that was prevalent when I started out, where it comes from um, also, and that's also interesting. Um, okay, other questions so far? I don't know if there would be. Um, yeah, actually, I have a question. Yes. Um, I think it was in the preface, uh, Carnap mentions the given. I think something about the myth of the given that I was looking into. Um, yeah. He doesn't mention you... the myth of the given. That's Sellers. <laughs> yeah, he mentions the given. Oh, I wasn't sure if it was the same thing or not. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the same thing, only he doesn't think it's a myth. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, I mean, Sellers is, uh, could have taught Sellers, Sellers in this course. I'm not really into Sellers that much, but I know some people who, I know several people who really are into Sellers, so I don't know, maybe there's more there than I, than I see, but, um, yeah, Sellers was also someone who was critical of logical positivism. Um, um, and one of the ways he was, criti criti he was critical of it was he thought that this thing about reducing um, uh, the whole content of our knowledge to the given was based on a myth, the myth of the given. Does that help or is there a more question about that? Yeah. Um, it I was reading something about it and it had something to do with um, something about like sense data and receiving it as knowledge, as given knowledge. It, it was kind of, I was trying to make sense of um, Carnap by going back into that. So. Right. Well, I think, I mean, um, it will be better to try to understand what Carnap thinks about it and what he means about it, what he means about it once we've read a little bit more. Um, because he doesn't, he mentions it in the preface. He mentions reduction of knowledge to the given as like a trend in uh, later 19th and earlier 20th century philosophy. Um, and he mentions certain people who he thinks have contributed to it. But he says he, that, that he doesn't think he could go it could advance anymore without being combined with this other trend that he knows about and these other people don't about the new logic. Right? That's what he says in the preface. 
so in other words he's saying like what i mean by the given is kind of like like what the earlier positivists this is where the term logical positivist comes from right i'm a positivist but a different kind of positivist what he's saying so the earlier positivists mock is the most famous one um uh, we're trying to reduce knowledge to the given and Carnap uh, says they got, you know, they've made a lot of progress, but to make any more progress, they're going to have, they're going to need these new uh, mathematical or logical techniques that I have, that I bring. So, I mean, so like to understand what he means by the given, you have to try to understand why he thinks that that's crucial to thinking about it correctly. So it definitely, I mean, it will turn out to have something to do with sense data. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll save saying more about that probably for the next lecture. Or, and then also we'll see his, he changes his mind about it as time goes on in his later work. So we'll see some of that also. Um, is, is, is that good enough for now? That's Octavia, right? You muted yourself again. All right. So I guess that means that it's good enough for now. Um, all right. So, um, so there's kind of, um, Three uh, like fundamental ways I can I can approach teaching this book, and I'm going to try to to get to at all of them. But um, the first one is just um, like what's up with this book? What is Tarnap trying to do? Why does he think it's so important? That's not really very readable, is it? I think this marker is going dry. Let's just flip it one more time. Um, right? Why does he think this is so important? Why? This is the one of the, the things that I realized from reading the preface so long ago that somehow in his, in his mind, this is connected with all these important issues of politics and so forth. Um, what's that connection? Um, so that's one way of approaching it. It's a little bit better. So the second one is, what does this have to do with science? Right, because uh, this course is called Philosophy of Science, so. Um, and I mean, obviously, the book does have something to do with science. He mentions right away in the preface in several different connections how important science is. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, um, he talks about a lot of things that are not obviously relevant to science. So, so I mean, so the question is like, what's his relationship? In what sense is this book philosophy of science might be a way of summarizing it. And then thirdly, there is the technical stuff that has to be explained to trying it to, to understand what he's doing. Right, because whatever it is he's doing and whatever it has to do with science, he firmly believes that this new logical techniques developed by Frege and Russell um, are absolutely crucial to doing it right. So, um, and he proceeds to spend a lot of time talking about them and using them. Um, he doesn't introduce them for beginners. He refers you to another book he wrote. If you need an introduction, I don't think that would be a very good introduction, actually. But um, but in any case, um, he kind of assumes he know what's going on with this 
notation and these techniques and just starts to apply them to something new. Um, now, I mean, you should have some familiarity with it from Phil Nine, but a lot of things are that he has in mind are either different from the way we think about it now, um, or um, um, are things that loom large for him that that now we didn't think we don't think are important enough to teach in an introductory course. Um, besides which I know a lot of times people find Phil 9 pretty difficult. <laughs> so for all those reasons, um, I am going to try to make sense of some of that technical stuff. And today, I think most of the time is going to be spent on this. Um, and then hopefully afterwards, I'll be able to spend um, that would like be the basis on which I can talk more about this stuff. Um, but I mean, I definitely always have these things in mind and they will come up today also. Um, and as far as this goes, I hope you noticed already in the preface that um, both of the things that I mentioned about the general reaction of modern philosophy to science are um, at work, at work again here, right? That is both the idea that philosophy now finally should become more like science and especially the physical sciences. Um, and that's how philosophy will finally be able to make progress the way the physical sciences have, right? So he says the previous attitude of philosophers was more like poet, was more like that of poets. But this new philosophy that's growing up has grown up in close connection with the sciences and we have the responsible attitude of the sciences. And also we are adopting the procedure of the sciences where rather than everyone build up their own system from scratch, we're gonna cooperate and little piece is gonna be added to little piece and we're gonna make progress back. That was not the subsequent history of logical positivism. <laughs> um, rather, um, they spent most of the time arguing about fundamental issues. Um, uh, Karniak restarted the system over and over on new basis and the old one didn't seem to work. So, I mean, uh, this vision that philosophers have had over and over again, I mean, Kant had it, Descartes had it, that from, you know, from here on in, philosophy was just gonna be a matter of, like all the fundamental issues were settled and now we're just gonna make progress on some incremental progress in remaining questions. It didn't actually happen, but, but it's, you know, this is another time it was projected. Um, so, um, and yet at the same time, there's still, and it, this is maybe not as obvious in the preface, but it's, it's, it's still, um, um, on the table is the question of what is philosophy? It's not just another empirical science, right? Although it's gonna be emulating the empirical sciences and mathematics in certain respects, it's not just another empirical science. So that leads the question, okay, what is left for philosophy? What is it that philosophy has to do that the sciences don't do for themselves? So he will address that in this book also. Let me just throw up my mic here. Okay. Um, so other questions about that before I start, before I dive into some of the technical details here? Okay. Um, so the book is about something that Carnap calls, um, well, in German, he calls it constitution theory. Remember, I mentioned the issue about the translation last time, but in English, he calls it construction theory. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, if we were talking about the relationship between Carnap and Husserl and Heidegger, it would be really important to drive into your head that it's not construction theory, it's constitution theory. But since we're not going in that direction at all, I think it's, you know, I, for our purposes, construction theory is fine. I'm just gonna call it construction theory. So um, what is it? Or what is it supposed to be? So um, the basic idea is that it's about the reduction of concepts to other concepts. Um, so, and the example that Carnap alludes to is a mathematical example, and this is an example that had already been worked through by Frege and Russell, right? As he also says in the preface, he says that the new logic has so far, um, besides solving the foundation crisis in mathematics, which, um, um, which I won't get into detail about, but it was basically that Frege, I mean, the, the timeline is a little weird here. Frege actually started developing the new logic because he thought he was going to put arithmetic on the foundation of logic and show that all of arithmetic follows from logic. And he uh, began working on an a huge book called the Grundgesetze der Arithmetik, the, the Fundamental Laws of Arithmetic. Um, and he started with some simple logical axioms and he was going to develop all of arithmetic on this basis. And then suddenly he got a letter, a letter from Bertrand Russell saying, um, well, I read your book and I really liked it, but I noticed that a contradiction follows from your axiom five. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a big disaster for Frege. Um, and uh, so the new logic, the way Russell then fixed it up or changed it was supposed to prevent that type of contradiction from happening. That's right. So, but Carnap says besides that, it's also already had positive results in mathematics in reducing some parts of mathematics to, uh, to others. And he says, you know, but I'm going to go on to apply it to philosophy in general. So, but the example he talks about, and I'm, gonna, I'm talking about where this example comes from, and whatever, because I'm going to try to talk about it in some detail, um, is the example of the reduction of the rational numbers to the integers, right? So the rational numbers, um, in case you don't, remember this i'm sure everyone learned this in school but right the rational numbers are or maybe i should start with the integers the integers are um zero one minus one two minus two and all those numbers <laughs> i mean not in this order obviously the, the negative ones are still on that side but this is a list of all the integers Right, so that's the integers, and the rational numbers are um, ratios of integers. Right, so like two thirds, three quarters, eight sevenths, right? like all these ratios, and that's why they're called the rational numbers. That all the ratios of integers are the rationals. Um, now, I mean. Not everything you can write down two ratios like this that are names of the same rational number. Right? These are the two thirds and four sixths are the same rational number. But um, but everything you can write down like this is the name of a rational number, and that's what the rational numbers are. So the question so the question is something like this. Um, Suppose I have uh, an axiomatic system of integer arithmetic. So that means, um, and actually, let me go to my nifty 
stocking this camera. Uh, this is on page seven, section two. Right. A theory is axiomatized when all statements of the theory are arranged in the form of a deductive system whose, um, whose basis is formed by the axioms. And when all concepts of the theory are arranged in the form of a constructional system whose basis is formed by the con fundamental concepts. So, I mean, uh, but axiomatization of the integers would require, according to Arnab, both the deductive system and a constructional system. So the deductive system means that there would be certain axioms um, from which also rules of inference, but anyway, there would be certain axioms from which following the rules of inference, you could deduce all the theorems. Um, actually, Girdle showed before this, had already showed that um, the, uh, the theorems couldn't be all the true statements about the integer. But never mind that. All the all the theorems of the system can be deduced from the axioms um, mechanically, so to speak, by, by following the rules of inference. That's the deductive system. But so what part is the constructional system? So the constructional system just means that whatever um, symbols there are that I use. Um, uh, can be defined in terms of the primitive symbols. So there's going to be, so yeah, actually, let me write it. In the deductive system, we have axioms which are statements that are taken to be true or asserted without proof. And then we have theorems, and the theorems are derived from or proved from the axioms. Right, that's the deductive side of the system. On the constructional side of the system, we have primitive concepts and relations. And then we have, so these are, so to speak, things that are taken to be meaningful without proof. Right, we don't say what they mean, we just start using them. And then we have derived concepts and relations. Um, and these are defined or as Carnap will say, constructed in terms of the primitive ones. So in the case of this system of integer arithmetic, um, it's not um, the constructional part, if, if there is one, is again, is going to concern um, maybe some relations that we define in terms of more primitive ones. And so we don't introduce the primitive uh, um, relations. Like we might, uh, we can define addition in terms of multiplication, for example. So rather than have multiplication be one of the primitive relations, we define it in terms of addition. Um, that's not that interesting, but anyway, like assume that's all been done. So we have an axiomatized system of integer arithmetic. And now um, we want to use that axiomatized system of integer arithmetic 
to show that, for example, um, two thirds is right, what example would I put in here? Two thirds is greater than one half. So how can we do that? I mean, it seems impossible, right? Because the axioms only mention, mention integers. And not only that, but um, the symbols, whether primitive or derived, are we only um, know what they mean when they're between integers. Right, so I mean, we have this symbol greater than, but as far as the way that symbol is used in our axiomatized system of integer arithmetic, greater than is the relationship between integers. Right, so we can write, you know, one is greater than zero, 15 is greater than minus seven, whatever. Um, and we can also write false statements like two is greater than three. They, we know what those mean and we know they're false. We know the others mean and we know they're true. But, you know, if someone says um, orange is greater than three, um, orange is not an integer, right? So in terms of our axiomatized system of integer arithmetic, we're not going to be able to say whether this is true or false. We're not going to be able to prove this or the negation of that. Um, and um, we're at least tempted to say it's because it doesn't mean anything. We only know what the symbol means when it goes between it. So now we have this situation where someone says, oh, I want you to tell me whether this is true or not. And it seems like it's going to be impossible. Okay, are there questions about this so far? So, um, so the answer is we first need to, um, in order to get our deductive system to work on a statement like this, we first need to extend the construction of system so that we can um, eliminate these names of rational numbers and translate this statement into a statement that's just about integer. Right, so um, that's why Carnap says um, um, What does construction mean? An object or concept is said to be reducible to one or more other objects if all statements about it can be transformed into statements about these other objects. Right, transformed, translated, basically. Construction in this sense is, um, or an object is constructible if you can translate anything you want to say about that object into statements that only mention some others, some other object, right? So in this case, we want to construct the rational numbers in terms of the integers, meaning we want to take all statements about rational numbers and translate them into statements about integers. So, um, so the basic idea um, roughly speaking, 
um, is that we're going to replace. So let's write it like this. And um, this uh, Blackboard bold Q stands for the rational numbers. So um, this symbol here is, is not the greater than relation among integers. It's really, we're writing it the same way, but it's really something else. So I'm labeling it greater than Q. We're going to translate this into a statement that involves integers and our old greater than relation, the integer greater than relation. So, and I mean, the basic idea is to replace it with that, right? This is a statement about integers. Two times two is greater than three times one. Um, we know what the greater than symbol means in this context. And we know this is true. So if we accept this as a translation of that, we can prove this is true in our axiomatized system of integer arithmetic. And then we prove this. So that's how the roughly speaking, how the construction is supposed to work. Now, I mean, um, people understand why this translation is going to get us the results that we want. Sorry, there's a question in the chat. What's the difference in concept and relations and axioms in this context? An axiom, so again, an axiom, remember I made a distinction last time between judgments or propositions and concepts. Um, an axiom is a judgment, a proposition, a statement. It's something that's either true or false, right? So an example of an axiom, so like when you axiomatize, usually people don't axiomatize the integers. Usually they start with the natural numbers, um, which starts with one. So, you know, and so one of the axioms will be something like, um, there exists some n such that there does not exist any m such that n is the successor of m. This is one of the axioms of the natural numbers, the piano axioms. Right, it says that there's some natural number that doesn't come after any other natural number, namely one. That's an axiom. Okay, so an example of a concept, or actually, I guess, of a relation here. So this is a relation, right? The relation that holds between N and M when N is the successor of M. Um, so this is so so this succession this successor relation is one of the primitive concepts and relations of natural number arithmetic, whereas this whole statement that's stated in terms of that primitive relation is one of the axioms. So like similarly, if you think about axiomatized geometry, which I hope more of you have experience with, right? Like the primitive concepts might be line, point, plane, right? The primitive relations would be like lies on, right? Like the relationship between a point and a line that holds from the line and the point lies on that line as the primitive relation, things like that, right? Whereas the axioms would be something like um, uh, Given any two points A and B, there exists a line such that A and B both lie on that line. Right? That would be one of the axioms of the geometrical system. Did that help? I, I, I'm going to read the, the questions because I just remember that you don't see the questions in the recording. Um, so Cardiac is saying that axioms in the 
reductive system, I guess it means, are reducible to more fundamental concepts than a, than a constitutional system would start with instead of axioms. Um, no, no, he's saying you need both. He's saying in an axiomatized system, you need a deductive part and a constructional part. The deductive part consists of axioms and rules for proving theorems from axioms. The constructional part consists of primitive concepts and rules for deriving or, or for, yeah, for deriving other concepts from the primitive ones or for, that is going the other direction or translating statements that involve the other concepts into ones that only have the primitive ones. So like, for example, in geometry, you know, you might have a theorem that says the exterior angles of a triangle, or sorry, the interior angles of a triangle add up to two right angles. So, um, so you, you need the deductive system part of geometry to prove this from the axioms. But you won't be able to do that without the constructional part because triangle and interior angle are probably not uh, primitive concepts of your geometrical system, right? So somewhere along the line, you define what it is to be a triangle and what it is to be the interior angle of a triangle. And perhaps also you define what it is to be the sum of angles, and, you know, lot, you know, stuff like that. So, um, so, uh, to prove this from the axioms, you both have to translate talk about triangles into talk about lines, points, and planes, if those are your primitives. Um, and you also, or lines, points, planes, and angles, maybe. And you also have to, um, once you've done that translation, you have to prove that your translated statement follows from the axioms. Right, because you might finish that translation and then find out that it translates to something that doesn't follow from the axioms, false, or at least unprovable. So it's not a theorem. Does that? So the constructional system is like a foundation for a deductive system. No, it's really. One isn't beside the other. That's why they drew behind, isn't behind the other. That's why I drew them next to each other. Right? Like they're two parts of what you need to do. If you're going to be able to take statements that, so like if you didn't introduce any terms except for the primitive ones, then you wouldn't need the constructional system at all, according to Kahn. If every theorem you wanted to prove just mentioned lines, planes, and points and angles, then you wouldn't need a constructional system. You would just use the deductive system to prove theorems from the axioms. But as soon as you want to talk about other things like triangles, you need the constructional system too, because the axioms don't mention triangles. They only mention points, lines, planes, and uh, angles. So to prove this, you're going to need the constructional system that tells you how to translate sentences about triangles into sentences that only contain the others. So there, one isn't the foundation of the other. There are two pieces that you need if you're going to prove theorem sections. But in the case we're talking about, it's more interesting um, because you might have thought that um, that uh, you couldn't just start with statements about the integers and then start proving all these things about the rational numbers, right? You might think, no, you need a new set of axioms for rational numbers, but no, it turns out you could, there are rules. And so far, I'm just giving you one example, not the rule, right? But it turns out there are rules that you can use to translate every statement about rational numbers into a statement about integers. So if you axiomatize the integers, you're done, right? That is, then you can also prove whatever you want to prove about the rational numbers. 
that's why it's interesting. Of course, it's going to be more interesting even than that if instead of integers and rational numbers, we're talking about like tables and sense data. That's what Parnap is headed for. Um, and in that case, the axioms are going to be, so to speak, axioms are mostly going to be general empirical statements. Right, like one that Carnap introduces pretty early on is basically that the time order is asymmetric. So if one experience comes, if experience one comes after experience two, it can't be the case that experience two comes after experience one. That's, so to speak, one of the axioms. But Carnap says that's just an empirical fact about our experiences. <laughs> um, right. So, um, so we're going to need those axioms, whether we know them a priori or whether they're empirical, the way Carnap is going to say they are. We're going to need those axioms, but we're also going to need those translation rules because the axioms are all going to be about our experiences. But we want to be able to say things about tables and chairs and dogs and uh, uh, the custom of hat tipping and all those other examples that Carnap mentioned as we go on. Does that make it any clearer what the two pieces are? If not, maybe if I go a little bit more into this example, it will help. Or maybe it'll make it harder. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so I mean, this is the rough idea. But the real way that you do this, um, um, is to define a rational number as a relation that holds between integers. Now, I mean, that's not as strange as it sounds maybe because basically you define rational numbers as ratios. So how's this gonna work? Like, let me erase this axiom here. Um, actually, let me this. Maybe I'll keep that. All right. So, um, so like corresponding to the rational number two thirds, I introduce a relation two thirds, or it's like R two thirds, that it holds between integers. So, what does it mean that it's a relation that holds between integers? I hope this is somewhat familiar from Phil Nine, but uh, you know. It means basically that, um, well, one way of looking at it is that it sets aside a set of ordered pairs that are gonna be the ones where this relation holds, so to speak. Another way to look at it is it's something that kind of goes between integers. And when you put it between two integers, it gives you a proposition that's either true, true or false, right? So it's something just like the greater than relation. You put the greater than relation between two integers and you get a statement that's either true or false. So we're gonna, so we're gonna say that two thirds, this, this is the trick here. And this actually is what Parnap thinks is crucial to his whole system. Rather than trying to identify two thirds with with some integers, a bunch of them, uh, a bunch of them in a certain shape or something like that, he's going to identify. We're going to identify the rational numbers with certain relations that hold between integers. And um, in particular, it's not that mysterious what the relation is. This relation R two thirds is going to be the one that holds between integers exactly when yes. Right, we're going to say um, um, n R two thirds m if and only if three times n equals two times m. So 
In other words, you want to say, oh, in other words, when n over m equals two thirds. But of course, although you're thinking this, you don't define it that way because that wouldn't get rid of the rational numbers, <laughs> right? There you have two rational numbers. That doesn't help us. You say it's the relationship that holds between n and m when this is true, and this doesn't involve any rational numbers. It's just about multiplication of integers. So what n and m does this hold between? Well, you know, uh, between two and three, between minus two and minus three, between four and six, et cetera. Um, if you want to know whether a given pair is on the list or not, you just apply this test. Right? So like four comma six is on the list because three times four equals, which is 12, equals two times six, which is 12. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, three comma eight is not on the list because three times three is nine and two times eight is 60. Um, so, you know, so among other things, that means that R two thirds and R four sixths are going to be the same relation, but R um, three eighths is not going to be the same relation, which is good. <laughs> That's what we want, right? These relations are fit to, to fill the role of rational numbers. There's one of them in every case where we want to say there's one rational number. But we still don't know how to um, eliminate the rational numbers from a statement like that. So that is, we don't have a constructional definition of the greater than sub Q relation, the greater than relation between rational numbers. Um, but, um, it's not hard to figure out what it is. Now, I mean, it's basically the same thing I wrote before, just made into a rule. And if I write it out in symbolic notation, it might look a little bit scary, but it's actually a pretty simple idea. And I am gonna write it in symbolic notation because Carnap likes to do this. For all n, for all n, for all p, for all q. Um, um, if so I get I, this is this is the translation of this. Rational number R is greater than rational number S. So for any integers M, N, P, and Q, if M has the small R relation to N and P has the small S relation to Q, then m times q is greater than n times q. Oops. Yeah, no, that's right, but it's confusing because I switched n and n. Right, so it says that this says that what I mean when I say that the one rational number is greater than another is take the relations that correspond to them. If I find two, a pair of integers that are in this relation, that is, are in this ratio to each other, and I find another pair that are in this relation, that is, are in this ratio to each other, 
And then I just do the usual rule for cross multiplication to check if, rash, if one rational number is greater than another. Right, because um, n over m is greater than m over p is the same as n times p is greater. Oops, this is p over q is the same as n times q is greater than m times p. Right, it's just that cross multiplication. Rule. So I'm saying is you know. When I take a state, when I see a statement like this about rational numbers, I think of these as ratios that can hold between integers. And I check to see whether integers in that, that are in those ratios have this property. And by doing that, I can get rid of all statements of that form about rational numbers and replace them with much more complicated statements <laughs> about integers. But still, statements that only involve integers. And again, something like this is what Carnap envisages is doing with, for example, the concepts table and chair. So that when I say, you know, there's a there's a chair next to the table, not in one step, but through a whole bunch of steps. I'm going to be able to replace that statement about the chair and the table with a long, 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 long thing with lots of quantifiers out at the beginning um, that um, is only about the given, the fundamental contents of our experience. Again, we'll talk more later about what he means by that um, and whether it's a myth or whatever. But that's the project here. He wants to do the same thing that Russell showed you could do with the natural, with the rational numbers, and and with the real numbers, whatever. He wants to do, take do, take that same technique and apply it to reduction of um, all knowledge to the given. Okay. Are there questions about that? Um, like, are there questions about this, this translation of this? Not that it matters for the rest of the course whether you know how to reduce to the rational numbers to the integers, but, um, but I feel like if you really understood what happened here, it'd be much easier to understand everything else that Carnap is doing. Um, and this example, I mean, by the way, like spoiler alert, Carnap can't actually do that with a statement like a, a chair is next to the table. He doesn't get nearly that far. So that would be way too complicated. He does a few basic steps. And, and then after that, he just has like a sketch outline of how it would work. Um, so, um, so in a in, so in a sense, this technical stuff is not really important to what he's doing, right? Like you can understand, you know, of those two th of those two three things that I wrote to begin with. What's up with this book? What does it have to do with science and technical stuff? Um, this technical stuff in a, is in a sense turns out not to really be essential to understanding those other two. But Carnap thinks it's essential. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's maybe that's not quite the way that it's put. Because it's not just that like he's wrong about that, but that it's It would really be essential if he could get it to work. He can't really get it to work. And it's not clear, as Klein would point out, whether he could possibly get it to work or not. So, but in any case, there aren't any details of him working it out to, you know, to the extent where it actually becomes interesting that you need to understand. But you do need to understand, or it would be really helpful to understand at least 
why he thinks that if he could do it this way, it would have the results he wants. Both for understanding what he's doing and also for understanding Klein's attack on it and, and other people's responses to this. So I'll just ask one more time if there's questions about this definition. Okay, well, because I'm skeptical as to whether everyone followed that, but maybe they did. Maybe I was so incredibly clear that everyone followed why this is a good translation of this. All right. Um, oh, yeah, Sean is asking something else. If he thinks you could hypothetically translate the statement of the chair. Yes, yes, exactly. Carnap's goal is that you that if the constructional system were finished, um, any meaningful statement could in principle be could in principle be translated into a statement about the, the fundamental concepts of the constructional system. Um, which will turn well, I don't know, I won't say in advance what they're going to be, but they're very fundamental concepts about experience. Um, okay, but and this is the way, this is what the translation would look like. In fact, um, so the places where this really gets out of control, I think I have not assigned any of, but um, um, Right, like here's one of his definitions. Um, that's what they look like. His notation is a little bit different. He's using an older notation. But, um, you know, and then as you get on, go on, they get longer than that. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to move up somewhat from the details and then try to describe um, in uh, less technical detail, but still somewhat technically, I guess, why Carnap thinks that this kind of system is going to do what he wants. Um, um, so there's basically four issues that Carnap, that are not obviously related to each other, but Carnap's insight or belief is that they are all sort of the same problem. That's the, um, that's what makes the book go. So the first one is um, the um, foundation problems in mathematics. Right, this I already alluded to, and it wasn't, I mean, I told you about the most dramatic example, but it wasn't only Frege, it was, so maybe Carnap's history of old and right after all. I, it was, you know, it, it gradually dawned on people that if you think about sets, this especially had to do with sets, that if you think about sets in the simplest possible way, what we now call naive set theory, like you said, you think, oh, a set is a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and if I can say what a bunch of stuff, the uh, property that a bunch of stuff might have in common, I've, I've, I've mentioned a set, right? It turns out that if you think about sets that way, you get a contradiction. Um, it's, uh, you actually get many contradictions. They're all related to each other somehow, but the most famous one, and the one that Russell managed to find in Frege's system as well, called the Russell paradox, has to do with the set of all sets that don't belong to themselves. 
it's, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go through the details of it, but if you if you're familiar with the paradox about the barber who shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself, shave all the men who don't shave themselves or whatever, um, right? And then you ask, does the barber shave himself? And either way, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so, right, you can do the same thing with sets by saying the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. So in order to fix that, um, people did a lot of different things. Um, but the one that was um, seemed most promising at this time and that Karniak took to be at this time took to be the only possible approach is called Russell's theory of types. And without going into too much detail, Russell's theory of types basically it's a uh, hierarchical, hierarchical system of sets where sets at a lower level can belong to sets at a higher level, but um, sets at a higher level can't belong to sets at a lower level or at the same level. So right away, the idea of defining a set of all sets that don't belong to themselves doesn't make sense, right? That's how it heads off that paradox. It says a set can't belong to itself. Belonging to is a relationship between sets at a lower level and sets at a higher level. That's the theory of types. So this is one of the problems. And this problem kind of takes to have basically been solved by Russell. It turned out to be not quite so easy. And there were other ways of getting at it that people preferred, whatever. But at this time, Carnap thinks it's been solved by Russell. The second one is um, traditional doctrine of modes of being. Now, I mean, this is really a Neoplatonic thing. Uh, um, so that is, it goes back some in the history of Aristotelianism, but it maybe doesn't necessarily go back to Aristotle himself, but goes back to the later Neoplatonist Aristotelians. Um, I guess you could, well, and it is in some way it's in Aristotle himself for sure, but not, in, well, whatever. Anyway, that's not relevant to this course. So it, um, Carnap, um, the, the version of it that Carnap is most familiar with is found in Husserl. Um, but I mean, he, he knows that there's versions of it in older metaphysics as well. I'm not sure exactly how much he knows about that. But in any case, so the idea here is that, um, for example, material bodies and um, uh, souls are not, don't exist in the same sense as each other. So, um, so uh, um, therefore, there isn't like one big genus of which material things, bodies and souls are subspecies. Um, um, they don't have anything in common, not even their mode of being. So the properties that one of them could have are properties that the other one doesn't just not have, but that don't make sense of applied to it. Right? I think you can hear already that there's some connection, or you could imagine there's some connection. I mean, I think the same analogy working the other way around was part of how Russell came to the theory of types in the first place. Um, so, um, um, right, so if you said, you know, uh, how big is this soul? or this soul is like, um, um, has a volume of three liters, it wouldn't just be false, it would be like nonsense. Or it would be metaphysically impossible, not just false or something like that. Um, and um, this is also related to the um, problem of individuation of sciences.
because Aristotle says there is one science of each genus, right? That is, sciences are, you know, one science has one subject matter. According to this view that there are different modes of being, there are highest genera that don't fall under any genus in common. Um, I mean, again, that's already true according to Aristotle in some sense, but it's not obvious that Aristotle has in mind examples like this, highest genera of substances, like bodies. So there, there's all bodies belong to a common genus, but, um, and all souls belong to another genus, but there's no genus that includes both of them. So that would mean on that way of div division, and that's one of the traditional ways of division, that um, uh, in some absolute sense, the science of physics is completely different from the science of psychology. They have disconnected subject matters. Um, So Carnap um, was alluding to this in our reading. Um, if you look on page nine, section four. Um, if a constructional system of concepts for objects, it can be taken in either sense is possible in the manner indicated, then it follows that the objects do not come from several unrelated areas, but there is only one domain of objects and therefore only one science. Right, so the thesis of the unity of science as it's understood by Carnap and other logical positivists is connected to this thesis of the unity of the object realm and the constructional system is going to be, um, I guess, um, I didn't mention what the constructional system does here. What the constructional system is supposed to do here is to get is to eliminate all those statements about the higher level sets and get everything down to statements about individuals that are not sets. Um, uh, so it shows that that whole hierarchy is um, just a matter of keeping your language straight so, so as not to contradict yourself, something like this. It's all just logic. Here, you could say the constructional theory is going to have the function of um, getting rid of all those separate object names and you'll end up with just one. And whatever is the science of that object realm, you could treat as universal science, right? Because everything that could be stated in the other sciences can be translated into a statement about the subject matter of that fundamental or universal science. Um, okay. Um, then there's a third issue, which again is not obviously related to these, which is how can we tell in advance which statements are meaningful? So um, we should be able to tell in advance before we figure out whether the statement is true or false, whether it's meaningful or not. Um, because if it's not meaningful, uh, it can't be true or false. So there can't be a way of figuring out whether it's true or false. So you must know, at least this is the thinking, you must know first um, what the statement means before you can decide whether it's true or not. And 
um, uh, a minimum for knowing what the statement means is knowing that it means anything. <laughs> Right, so this should be the first thing you can figure out when someone gives you a statement. Now, I mean, when you have something like a chair is next to the table, we don't usually worry about this, right? But when someone says something like, um, um, the world is composed of an infinite number of monads, or the realm of pure consciousness would would persist unchanged even if the physical world were annihilated, right? When people say things like that, we sometimes start getting suspicious that maybe it doesn't mean anything, right? Or when people say um, that um, something like um, silverware exists, but plate set, but place settings are merely a construction of our consciousness. <laughs> right? That would be an example of what's called metaphysics of minor entities, maybe. Right? Someone would be is like a, um, an idealist about place settings, but a realist about silverware. <laughs> right? And then you can imagine two people arguing about that and someone saying, no, there really are place settings out there in the world. They're not constructed by our consciousness. And the other person saying, no, there's only silverware, place setting for, right? And you can imagine looking at that argument and thinking, wait, are they actually arguing about anything? Does this mean anything? Right? So in philosophy, it often turns out that although we should be able to answer this question first thing, we're not sure how to answer it. <laughs> um, again, you can see how that might be connected to this, right? Because the way we solved the paradox was by saying, um, oh no, we have rules that make that statement, this that is not a number of itself self meaningless, right? That rule out that way of making a statement. Um, and you can see how it's related to this, because again, at least one of the ways of understanding what would be wrong with saying this soul has a volume of three liters is that it's nonsense. Right? So hopefully, if we can get these things, well, I mean, hope, it's hard to say which one is first, but you can see why Carnap thinks that these might all be the same problem. That what, what's wrong with those metaphysical statements, assuming something is wrong with them, but Carnap thinks something is, right, is that um, they're nonsense, they violate the rules for making meaningful statements. But then he's gonna say, we don't notice it because we don't notice how things from different levels of the construction system have gotten mixed up. And then there's one more thing, which is, um, How do scientists have a right to talk about unobservables? And by have a right to talk about, I mean, again, we're not asking whether they're saying the right thing about it. We're asking how they can so much as talk about it. Um, so, right, like when I, when I say I'm an empirical scientist and I'm telling you that the way this computer works here, you can't see my computer, of course, but I'm pointing at it. <laughs> um, I'm telling you, the way this computer works here is that uh, electrons, you know, um, are being put into the conduction band and transistors and blah, 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 blah. And you say, wait, have you ever seen an electron? And they're like, no, no, well, it's much too small to see. 
And then they'll say, like, if they're barking, for example, they'll say, too small to see. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? You've abandoned empirical science. Um, and instead, you're talking about this fantasy of things that are not accessible to our senses. What gives you the right to do that? You, you have no right to do that, you know? Um, so, uh, well, I guess maybe Bark is not the best example, but um, but there were a lot of people who were not idealists like Barclay who attacked um, atomism in its modern incarnation, um, saying that, yeah, we, we've never seen these atoms. It's just a way of, you know, um, it's just a calculating device. Um, but once you start to take them seriously, you're just going off into never never. So what, you know, what gives scientists the right to talk about these things and still be doing empirical science? Um, so, I mean, this is the part where uh, it becomes clearest what this has to do with philosophy of science, right? And Karnap is going to say, well, it's, it's the same problem. Yes, being an empirical scientist means you can only talk about things that are immediately accessible, that are given. And again, we'll talk about exactly what he means by that. But that's what it means. So how can we talk about, um, and he's going to say, not only electrons, how can we talk about tables and chairs, <laughs> right? And tables and chairs are not the same as the things that are immediately given to me. Um, how can we talk about any of these things? Well, if we can translate them using the constructional system into statements about the given, then um, we can uh, uh, empirically determine whether they're true or false in principle. I mean, in most cases, it's going to require more data than we're actually going to have, right? But in principle, I can change these statements into statements about the given. And then you might say, well, what do you need all this other complicated stuff for? Well, it's basically because of this, because you say, oh, wait, so Karnak, you mean empirical science is all just about my experiences? It's just this solipsistic endeavor? Um, and, uh, um, and moreover, this is really weird because, you know, you're saying this statement, the chair table is next to the chair is about my experiences. But I know that a table is not one of my experiences, and a chair is not one of my experiences, and they don't even have the right properties to be my experiences. For example, they have a volume, and an experience doesn't have a volume, right? Like the chair, has, let's say, has a volume of three liters. I don't know if that's reasonable or not, but anyway, say the chair has a volume of three liters. It can't be an experience. An experience doesn't have a volume. So Carnap is going to say, oh, yeah. Well, in one sense, there's only one object realm, and there's only one science, and it's about that object. But in another sense, um, there's a whole hierarchy of object realms set out by the constructional system, and things at one level don't have the same kind of properties as things at the other level. They have a different mode of being. So. so a chair and a table really are completely different things from your experiences. They have nothing in common with them. The only thing, though, that makes it, um, gives the scientists the right to talk about them is that I can translate all the statements about those objects into statements about the um, All right, uh, are there questions about that? There was one question I didn't see before. Carnap thinks that only empirical statements are meaningful 
then does he think that only statements about the empirical world can be true or false? Well, uh, I mean, so as you know, as you might know, Wittgenstein in the Tractatus starts out by saying the world is a collection of facts. <laughs> um, in other words, what is the empirical world? Uh, it's, you know, I guess you could say, following Wittgenstein, the world, the empirical world is the collection of empirical statements that are true or whatever. Um, or you could say the empirical world is whatever empirical statements are about or something like that. Yeah, so I mean, I think those, some, some or other, those things have to go together. But I mean, to say exactly how they go together, you have to say what you mean by the empirical world, right? But, um, but presumably, whatever the empirical world is, um, it's going to be the one that empirical statements are about. <laughs> and if only those are true or false, then only statements about the empirical world are true and false. Um, but again, notice he wants the empirical world to um, include all kinds of really different things, right? These, like sensible objects, like tables and chairs, um, objects of mathematical science, like electrons and fields, um, psychological objects, uh, cultural objects, like states and religions and customs of hat tipping and whatever. Like all of these things are somehow going to fit into the structural system. Um, what's going to be left out? Well, from Karnas' point of view, nothing is going to be left out <laughs> because all those statements that claim to describe other things that don't fit in here are meaningless. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I think that's all I have time for today. So I will see you guys on Thursday.